Why, hello there, creeps, and welcome to another episode of Madams and Murderers. I'm your host, Malia Molino, happy to bring you guys another scrumptious story. Seeing as it's Pride Month, I've reflected on my previous tales and realized, you know, I haven't been as inclusive as I should be. So this week, it's all about the brothels that didn't cater to the hetero variety, and instead, we're going to be exploring the notorious Molly Houses of 18th century London. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the term, Molly was a nickname given to gay men in the 18th century, as well as female prostitutes, just one of a myriad of nicknames the Brits gave to working ladies. Truly, they have a lot. Molly houses were taverns, clubs, and coffee houses where gay and trans men could go and be with other men. Keep in mind, sodomy was a capital offense, and if caught, the act would literally cost you your neck. However, from the documentation that exists, which only really started being recorded around 1710, so we can't speak to the times before, but in the 1720s, we know that there was about 600,000 people living in London proper. Amongst that ravaging group, about 30 Molly houses, which comparatively would be like 200 with today's population. The upshot is, despite being gay being a capital offense, there was a poppin' gay subculture thriving in London but it doesn't mean that they were accepted and the raids happened frequently. It is the raids that took place from 1726 to 1728 that we get the best glimpse into the life and tragedies of those poor men and trans men who had no other choice but to patronize Molly houses. Creeps, it's time to tell the tale of Miss Muffs and Mother Claps Molly houses in good old area of Whitechapel. If your heart just skipped a beat when I mentioned Whitechapel, I'm so happy because that must mean you are a fellow Jack the Ripper fanatic and this tale just got a lot more exciting for you. Sadly, this took place roughly 150 years before the Ripper would have a field day playing operation with a bunch of floozies. But still, it paints a picture. Whitechapel, no offense, has always been a great place to either get fucked or get killed. Again, no offense. Also, Technically, Mother Clapp's house was in Holborn, which is just a hop skip away from Whitechapel, and by the infamous Sodomites Walk area just by Finsbury Square. Now, Mother Clapp's house wasn't technically a brothel, although it served as one. Let me explain. Margaret Clapp, the woman who owned the home with her husband John Clapp, who was barely there, operated a coffee shop that just happened to be able to sleep 40. That's not because it had tons and tons of bedrooms, but more because she put beds everywhere. What's confusing about Margaret, or Mother, as she was affectionately called due to her doting nature of her guests, is it seems like she was an ally for the gay community in a time where there weren't many, and yeah, she was, but her motives are strangely unclear. For one thing, she didn't charge everyone to be there, only some. She also had two prostitutes living there for two years, yet from all accounts, they didn't pay. Were they a service she offered? It's never confirmed that it was. She'd go across the street to the pub and bring back alcohol for everyone, but not charge off the top. Why did she do it? Some say pleasure. Others say she did it for entertainment, doing some small part to a mischievous nature she tried not hard to hide. A fact made quite clear by her retelling of a story of taking the stand in defense of a former patron to save him from the noose, and it worked. But instead of telling a harrowing tale of justice, she told it as amusement, with a laugh, and that's just odd. Even more odd is the marrying room. The marrying room, my friends, is one of the only proper bedrooms in the home where men could go and consummate their relations, and standing guard over the usually kept open door, was a man named Cleston, who was definitely a male prostitute, the only other confirmed prostitute to live at the house. So to me, this is a fucking brothel. Like, there's reports of full-on orgies going on, and she's just standing there, watching. I mean, I guess it's just like porn, but live. Porn theater. Not a horrible concept. Just saying. Whatever her reasons were, her house was undoubtedly one of the most popular Molly houses in the area. For two solid years, men had a place to be with whoever they wanted and do the things they couldn't do on the outside, except she was unaware that her house had been under surveillance for the full two years she'd been in operation. 
Who was surveying the home? The police? <laughs> no. The fucking society for the reformation of manners. My God, these people did not know how to have a good time. If you swore, if you were a little crass, if you enjoyed yourself a little too much, and God forbid you enjoyed the occasional paid tryst, then you, my friend, were in danger of being outed by these square-ass motherfuckers. That entire sentence? Yeah, I'd be public enemy number one. Thankfully, these assholes basically dissolved in the 1730s because no one has time for that bullshit. But sadly, for Mother Clap and her happy lads, no such luck. These prudish buggers were often helped in their endeavors by undercover agents, aka pissed off former mollies, that wanted to get back at their lovers, such as a guy named Mark Partridge, who was outed by his lover, not cool, so he turned around and decided to help bring down all the molly houses and in turn, have a lot of men killed. Definitely even less cool. However, Mr. Partridge will not be the only villain in this story. February of 1726, the police burst into the coffee house and arrest 40 men from the property, as well as Miss Clapp herself. None of the men had been caught in the act, as it were. Some had things like buttons undone, but that was about the extent of it, which meant many walked free upon there being no evidence or solid charges to draw them up on. For others, though, things wouldn't go as well. Two pimps had operated out of the clap house with the knowing consent of the misses, and both of them, Thomas Newton, aged 30, and Ned Courtney, aged 18, would attempt to save their own necks by spilling the beans about every man they'd ever bed, and some they hadn't, but lured into bed under the guise of entrapment with the help of the police. Because why? Well, fear of death will make people do many, many things. The testimonies of Ned, Thomas, and Mark kept six people at Newgate Prison awaiting trials, including Mother Clapp, who Thomas attempted to post bail for in perhaps a show of thanks for all the customers she'd brought him, or more likely due to his guilt of this being partially his fault. Sadly, the testimonies of the convicted, despite the pleas that they were straight and married or didn't know it was a Molly house, didn't sway the jury. Instead, May 9th of 1726, William Griffith, Thomas Wright and Gabriel Lawrence were carted off to Tyburn Prison, where they would be hung in a public execution along with three others, one of those being a very famous lady, Catherine Hayes, who we'll be talking about next week. As for Mother Clap, well, it's not good. It's not death, but it's not good. After the courts didn't buy her plea of, I'm a woman, so therefore I cannot be guilty or responsible for acts of sodomy or running a disorderly house, she was sentenced to stand in the pillory, two years imprisonment and a fine. The pillory are stocks, you know, the contraption where you stick your head in the middle hole and your hands go in the other holes. Not great. And she didn't handle it well. Almost every time she was put into it, people would kick her. She'd faint and collapse or just, you know, go into a convulsive fit. At the time, the papers reported it didn't appear as though she would survive the ordeal. And she might not have. Unfortunately, her story goes cold, and there is nothing further written about poor old Mother Clapp. Mother Clapp's Molly House was just one of many that had been raided. Another infamous case comes in 1728 with the raid of Miss Muff's house in Whitechapel. <laughs> also, we just gotta give it up to the name because Miss Muff is just chef's kiss. Miss Muff's Molly House was owned and run by Jonathan Muff, who, by the title I'm sure you would have guessed, would have been what they would have called a male lady, basically a cross-dresser. Because of the terminology of the day and due to the fact that these people have been dead for, well, centuries, we can't ask them, hey, what did you identify as? So maybe they were trans or non-binary, or perhaps they just enjoyed dressing like women. We can't know. But... We do know that this house in particular made waves when it was raided during a drag party because of its infamous male ladies and the nine they arrested. Thankfully, none of the men arrested were sentenced to death. Two were whipped, others acquitted, but one man named Thomas Mitchell attempted to kill himself by slashing his wrist so bad while awaiting in his cell he had nearly succeeded until he was rushed to hospital and given blood. The picture that's been painted for me over the various articles and stories written by much more knowledgeable folks than I is one of great color and happiness hidden behind the dark doors of dreary London. The parties, music, gatherings of notable and important artists are probably why we have so much great art coming from that time period. Had these people not had places to go to feel to free to be themselves, God knows what this world would have been lacking. 
It's important to talk about the history of homosexuality, not just during Pride Month, but always, because let us not forget that many people, whether that be in America or elsewhere in the world, are still hiding, terrified in the closet, worried about what their coming out would mean. Would they lose their job, lose their family, be treated different? Hell, in some countries, would they lose their life? From 1749 to 1843, when England outlawed executions for homosexuality, 49 men had been hung. That's not including the men we talked about today. God knows how many were killed before 1749. God knows what the number has been since 1843. In America, it is said that one in five hate crimes are against the LGBTQ community. Like race, we have a long way to go before there is a true equality. And sadly, Places like the Molly Houses of George and London still exist out of necessity. Until everyone can get on board with the idea that love is love, we need to continue to shine a light on the injustices of the past, the present, and be an ally in the now and for the future. Because love is love. And if you're worried about what's in someone else's pants or under their shirts, you're a pervert (laughs) and you should probably work on that. Thank you guys so much for listening to today's tale. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please take a second to rate, review, and subscribe. It does make a huge difference. On a personal note, I just want to say that I love you all and encourage you to do whatever you can to help spread love, peace, and equality in your communities. After a year of separation from our peers, it's needed now more than ever. Don't forget to check out my YouTube channel. I am steadily putting up new content each week, including a four-part grave hunting special in Nashville. So you'll definitely want to check that out. Link, as always, is in the show notes. Until next week, chin chin creeps.